This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 21. Now before we get started, let's make sure we are prepared to study God's Word by ensuring that we have confessed our known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we want to allow the Holy Spirit to control us, give ourselves over to Him. This way we get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things I should mention here now and then is that I don't teach at a level that many people preach. Many preachers will preach to a maybe a, well, we would call it junior high in our area, around an eighth grade or ninth grade level, maybe even less to reach the audience. But I'm assuming that most of you have at least a high school education, if not more. So I do uh, use a vocabulary that's a little higher than, uh, I shouldn't say a little higher, but much higher than I think an eighth grader or ninth grader. But this is part of growing as well. We grow our vocabulary, we grow our understanding I mean, you should understand terms like justification, propitiation, uh, vindication, uh, substitutionary atonement. These are all key theological terms. And then there's the- theological categories like Christology, soteriology, uh, pneumatology, eschatology, ecclesiology. These are terms that, as a Christian who is maturing, they should know well because these are very common terms used in uh, Christian doctrine. Uh, doctrine that we are to learn to grow spiritually. They're used throughout Scripture in uh, one form or the other. At least the categories are there, and many of these words are there. Vindication, justification, propitiation, uh, atonement. These are words we should be familiar with. And, of course, there's a lot more. But this is part of the growing process, to grow our vocabulary. And I'm also teaching. I'm not just preaching. Preaching emphasizes... Uh, a method of communication that people often are uh, used to because someone wants to convince them of something. It's kind of a persuasive approach, and they use illustrations and stories. You know what I'm talking about. And and they assume that people can only concentrate for about 20 or 30 minutes, so that pretty much limit their concentration. And then you break that up now and then with a story or a joke or something, and And that's not the best way to learn. It's amazing because when we're in high school, uh, we don't take a a break every 20 minutes or 15 minutes and expect a joke from the teacher. If we're serious about history or something that takes some uh, concentration, even the English literature, something like that, we keep our focus. Now, we may drift out now and then, but we come back and uh, we take notes and we're serious about learning the material. That's my approach. Uh, I'm not a preacher. I can preach. I've been trained to preach. In fact, I think I'm a pretty good preacher, but it takes a lot of time away from your in-depth study to prepare a sermon. And I don't think that's what I'm to do. I've never liked doing that. I've felt awkward even when I've done it because I don't think that's what I should do in a church. Even when I was in seminary, I didn't particularly like the class. I mean, it was fun. It was easy. Uh, and it's more like you're doing a performance, but uh, I don't care about that. And I know you don't grow like that nearly as much as if you take uh, teaching seriously. So that's my approach, and I continue that. So this requires not passive listening, but active listening. That is, you're paying attention. After all, many of these are life and death issues and eternal truths. Now, when it comes to wisdom, Again, I remind people that these are not always framed in a a sense of a a promise. They're basically general truths. This is the way things will usually work out if you follow these instructions. And there's always exceptions. I I always use a simple illustration. Uh, Basically, Proverbs teach if you work hard, uh, you can make good money and become uh, well-off or maybe even wealthy. Well, that's not always true, 
because there's many people who, for various reasons, hit obstacles in their profession. It may be uh, you come up against opposition or you become ill or that particular type of business uh, is no longer popular or wanted or phased out, something like that. So the, these are general principles for the most part, and they uh, usually work. And this is the way God has set it up. Now, I think the promises are obvious. They're kind of few and far between, though. But it's all truth. It's all truth. It's just a matter of what degree is it true. Uh, and you say, well, that sounds kind of strange. Well, it just depends on the circumstances. And like I said, they're general truths. There can be exceptions to all these rules. And uh, just think about that as we go through these. There are exceptions. But generally, you do this and you will benefit God will benefit you for following his rules, though he may test you, which sounds like, well, the rules get broken now and then. Well, the rules, as I said, is it's like the truth. It's not, they're not absolute truths. That is, they're not true in every occasion. So understand what I'm saying. It's not true on every occasion. There will be exceptions. And that's the way life is. Well, these next two verses, we're just going to pick up where we left off. 21 and 22. This is 25, 21, and 22. Teaches how to resolve a conflict with someone who opposes you. Now, the different translations will use different words here. I like to use the more literal, one who hates you. Some will translate this enemy. Okay. Enemy to me has a little uh, more specific meaning than just someone who hates you. When I think of enemy, I think of a foreign enemy or uh, someone who is really out to destroy you, or a group of people, something like that. This is more on an individual basis. So I translate it, If one who hates you is hungry, give him food to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. So verse 21 gives us what you are to do. Verse 22 will give us why. So what is this saying? Let's just break it down. One who hates you. The word for hate is sona. Uh, basically, hate's the best translation. He despises you. He opposes you. As I said, many translations use the word enemy. Now, this is not someone you're at war with or someone coming down the road and they're riding in the streets and they're attacking people and they're burning buildings, uh, but they're at odds just the fact that you live in that area. All right? Uh, this is an upset neighbor, a co-worker, someone that for some reason holds something against you personally. Uh, it sounds a little absurd if you have someone riding in the streets and they're burning buildings and coming your direction and you can see them with the torches. You know, we can uh, use our imagination here. You wouldn't run out there with a bottle a bottled water and say, here you go. Uh, you know, just to kind of give them a break. No. But that would be a, uh, well, a misapplication of what this is saying. Because you don't understand who you're doing this for. But you might help someone who hates you for something personal. Who is in dire need of food? So this is a situation if is he is notice is hungry. That means he, has, doesn't, he doesn't have anything to eat. The command, give him food to eat. Also, the other side of that, and if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Now, water is mentioned, not wine. Well, wine was common in this part of the world, but wine uh, uh, was more of a luxury at times. But the point of water here is it's basic. It's a basic need. The objective is to help relieve your neighbor of his immediate physical needs. Now, I think we can understand this rather simply. Someone who despises you for some reason has no food. Something happened. Maybe it was a disaster. Maybe it was a family who lost the primary breadwinner. And they're short on food, and yet you've always had them as, well, let's put it this way, they, you've never gotten along with them. This changes things. You have an opportunity to 
go in there and show some love during this very difficult situation. Now, we have similar sayings throughout the law. Remember, this is still during the time of the law, so you have that as the background. Let's look at some of those. And I think it kind of uh, gives us a, a better perspective on this. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 23, 4 through 6. I'll put it on the board. If you encounter your enemy's ox... Now, notice how they use the word enemy here in this translation. Or his donkey wandering away, you must return it to him. Now, your enemy's ox, this would be obviously some sort of neighbor. Okay, so there's your their usage here. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall leave it helpless for its owner. You shall not leave its help. <laughs> Let's make sure we get this clear. You shall not leave it helpless for its owner. You must arrange the load with him. So, these are really pretty simple. You don't leave a neighbor's donkey uh, helpless. It might die. It might get hurt. You help him. Uh, you're not returning hate to an enemy. That's, that's what we see here. Look at verse 6. You shall not pervert the justice due to your needy brother in his dispute. In other words, don't take advantage of his situation just because he hates you. All right, help them. It's a wonderful illustration, I think, of the application of this proverb. Let's go to another one under the law, Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may certainly rebuke your neighbor, but you are not to incur sin because of him. Don't, don't return bitterness or hatred or anger, sinful anger, because of something he does or feels towards you. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor hold any grudge against the sons of your people. That's Israel. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Um, this, I think, is just a, a wonderful perspective of how to treat people. Let's go to Job. Job 31, 29 through 32. I think these are all pretty good. Remember, Job is often defending himself and his righteous life. Listen to what he does. If I rejoice at the misfortune of my enemy or become excited when evil found him? No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life in a curse. Look, if he is undergoing a difficult time, I used this expression not long ago, don't don't uh, kick a dead horse. If he's already down and, and uh, his uh, justice might be falling on him, uh, don't go up there and gloat or wallow or just show pleasure because He's getting punished, and he's also uh, a creation of God, and he's has life that God gave him, and he needs Christ, and uh, just let it lie between him and the Lord. Look at verse 30. No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life in a court curse. So he's not adding to it, you see. Verse 31. Have the people of my tent not said... Who can find one who has not been satisfied with his meat? So the idea is that generally he's been pretty good to people. All right. He's apparently he's sold meat to people. and They've eaten it. And they're happy with it. Verse 32. Another principle. The stranger has not spent the night outside for I have opened my doors to the traveler. So this is general hospitality. The general good righteous life that Job lives. We don't open our houses to strangers very often. I mean, it's something that uh, usually you have to know them because of just too much distress today, but that's your own judgment call. But you can see the goodness and the righteousness in people's lives and just show how they generally love people. Uh, and this is what we're to do. We don't necessarily fuss over them or gush over them, but, but generally we treat people good. Uh, some in Proverbs we've uh, studied recently. Proverbs 24, 17, and 18. Let me just put those back up directly here. When your enemy falls, do not rejoice. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. 
Verse 18, otherwise the Lord will see it, and it will be evil in his eyes, and he will turn away his wrath from him. So you may just get yourself under some of that judgment on you because of the way you gloat or uh, rejoice over a enemy that's went down. Let God deal with it. That's between him and the Lord. Well, now we come to our reason for feeding our neighbor from verse 21, and that's in verse 22. Let's just read 21 again. If one hates, if one who hates you is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. I remember when I studied this verse many years ago, uh, scholars were trying to figure out, what does this mean to put burning coals on his head? Well, I think they come to a conclusion of what this probably means for a number of years now, so you may never have known that they did not know what this meant. But uh, I still don't think they've discovered the origin of this saying. They'd like to go back and say, well, this is an Egyptian saying. Some think that's the case. In fact, it is an Egyptian saying, and they're, they, find, they may find something similar in their literature. But we really don't know the exact origin. So if you don't know the origin, it's hard and sometimes find the exact interpretation but i think what we've come up with in recent years is the best and the best interpretation is to see this as the idea that heaping burning coals on the head of a person who hates you is a way of bringing him burning pangs of shame to his conscience in other words you're going to well how do you put this? Make him feel worse by being nice to him. Now, this is a good thing for the enemy to see that you hold no animosity towards him by your good act. This is overcoming evil with good. His shame would produce remorse and contrition. And he realizes he had no reason to treat you like he did. Or he may change his attitude about people. You know, everyone hates me because I have a bad disposition all the time. And then you show some kindness out of nowhere. And he realizes that, you know, I've been thinking wrong towards people. And there are people who uh, live to be, uh, you know, well into life, and there may be their 30s and 40s before they begin to realize not everyone's that bad. But there are a lot of crummy people out there. Let's, let's not mess that either. But that doesn't mean we speak, we, we treat them that way. So understand, this is not literally pouring coals on someone's head, but the picture is that he would feel shameful pain because of a good deed from you. Then look what happens at the end of this verse. And the Lord will reward you. So even those people who give you problems, be good to them. Don't lower yourself to their standards. Now, let's go back to the previous verse and tie this together. When you help someone in dire need who hates you and he's hungry and thirsty for something that's happened, maybe he lost everything. Maybe he had a house fire and he lost everything. Um, help him. In that moment while he's eating or drinking, finally... His attitude toward you may change for the better. He may open up like he never has before and uh, begin to realize his priorities have been wrong. His hatred has been misplaced and he has no reason to hate you, but rather may apologize and uh, come around and become a friend. That's rare, but it happens. Sometimes, though, their hate is so strong they reject your help. That's another problem, but we're not talking about that here. Verse 23 talks about the sting of painful speech. These are just, continue, just a, a string of practical principles of wisdom to apply in our lives. This is about a backbiter. The north wind brings rain and a backbiting tongue and angry face. Let's talk about the rain first of all. It says it's a north wind. Now, in the Middle East, the rain and wind would normally come from the west, from the direction of the Mediterranean Sea. So when this says it's coming from the north, this is unusual. It kind of comes out of nowhere. You don't expect it. 
Uh, this is hidden talk about someone, uh, a whispering tongue behind their back until it gets spread around and and then that that person gets wind of it. You, you learn, let's say it's for you and it's towards you and you get wind of it and it doesn't make you happy. Once the word gets spread like this, it's all the more difficult to defend yourself. Uh, it's already gotten out there and spread around and no one really got the whole story or the other side of the story. And this is where uh, the tendency is to get angry. You can't do much about it now. The point is that in the land of Israel, just as the north wind brings rain, so a backbiting tongue, speech, brings anger to the victim. Verse 24 we've seen before, and one I suppose the writer of the Proverbs, the editors, as well as the Spirit of Course, wants us to understand clearly. This is another warning as well as practical uh, situation that happens in marriage. Uh, few marriages are perfect. Don't let the uh, romance novels or television romance uh, shows fool you on this. Uh, romance is often emotionally filled and sometimes misguided. But true love is contentment and uh, treating the other person with respect and uh, taking care of their needs, those types of things. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. When you talk about loving someone, you talk about commitment for life. And that is uh, at the core of a good marriage, commitment for life. Verse 24, a man trying to live with a contentious life, a wife rather, <laughs> could make life contentious, but uh, it's really about the wife. She's quarrelsome. Better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, we just saw something about the north wind. Sometimes they relate them this way, you know, like you'll hear somebody tell a joke and then they'll lead right into another joke and they'll do another joke and they're all kind of slightly related that way. He keeps his memory sharp of what the next joke is. And this is it's similar in the Proverbs in that you see a pattern of uh, a word or maybe a theme continue on. And here we have a person in, in the corner of the house. Now, why is he being in the corner? To protect him from the wind and the rain. That's the only shelter up there. Try to get in the corner opposite the blowing of the wind. So he's covered. This is basically identical to 21.9. We saw that earlier. This is a nagging wife who makes life miserable for the husband. He has nowhere uh, to go. He's he's unprotected. Even he goes to the uh, roof, which was open in those days. It's kind of like their porch. In this case, it's kind of like the doghouse on the porch. But he's up there, and uh, he's unprotected. There's some protection, particularly if he's in the corner, but not much. But it's better to have that little bit of protection from the weather and be away from the wife than constantly being exposed to her complaints and harassment. There's a word for you wives out there. Be careful about your complaining and your harassing because it becomes harassment after a while. We call that nagging. And you don't really realize you're doing it until you kind of total them up to the end of the day and how many times you talk to your husband. And then every time you did, it was a complaint or harassment. Be careful about that. That's not good. That's not good. Many times they have their hands full. But, you know, if you got a lazy husband, that's another matter. But we're not talking about that here. We're just talking about a, a wife who's basically quarrelsome. She's ready to fight about it. She's unhappy about everything. You can't please her. Can't even talk to her. Better live in the corner on the roof, getting away from her. Now, this is interesting. I'll bring this contrast up because if you go back to Proverbs 5, 18 through 19, there you have a pleasant marriage. It talks about a sexually satisfying wife, 5, 18 and 19. Much different picture there. Verse 25 tells us how good news refreshes one's life. Here's what you want to hear. Here's what you want in your life. Verse 25, like cold water to a weary person, so is good news from a distant land. Now, cold water, of course, and especially in the desert areas, 
not that frequent unless you got it deep from a well or perhaps uh, it's, it's kept cool for some reason. They use, I think, some sort of clay pot in those days to keep the water cooler. The word for person here is nephish. That's the basic inner man, who you are. It's an uplift to your uh, inner person as well as your physical body. It's one of the best things you can give to a person who is tired and weary. Hardly anything better. As compared to good news from a distant land. Now, the thing about travel and news in those days, obviously it was slow. Many examples of this, suppose there was a war or a famine in the distance and a loved one was there and you find out that that's over or they've gotten relief or they've gotten hope. That's good news, but it may take a while for you to get that news and you may have waited a month or two to get it. And your anxiety level has been up and you don't like that. Uh, I think of a, a son who goes off to war. Um, that immediately knocks up your anxiety level. It also knocks it up as soon as he joins the military. You know, there's a potential for him to go to war. But if he's a Christian, you know he's in the Lord's hands. He's really just as safe on the battlefield as he is at home, in his own bed, if he still lives at home. But uh, understand that the analogy here is that good news is good to hear. It's refreshing. like cold water to a weary person. Verse 26. By the way, you want to cheer someone up and you know some good news? Give it to them. Verse 26 so shows a lack of consistent righteousness. These are so good. Verse 26. Like a muddied spring and a ruined well is a righteous person who gives way before the wicked. A muddy spring and a ruined well is something that's really no good for drinking. It's all messed up. It's fouled, okay? For some reason, it may be polluted or just fouled. Maybe the animals trample through it or relieve themselves in it. It gets foul somehow. Now, this was really a, a big uh, no no in the desert uh, for one to befoul a watering hole in the desert is considered just unforgivable because it's a much needed resource for every passerby. So as compared, like a muddied spring and a ruined well, is a person who gives way before the wicked. Now what does this mean? Gives way as the idea is he doesn't hold to his principles. He doesn't hold to his own righteousness. Here he's mentioned as righteous. And he lets it go. He lowers his standards. He does something uh, sinful, out of line. Perhaps he's one of those who goes back and forth between doing the right thing and the wrong thing. He's, he's fickle, or she's fickle. You don't know what they're going to do. You can sort of trust them, but not wholeheartedly. So you never know for sure which way they will go or how they will act. Inconsistency is the word here. But at the same time, he's compromised. And it's compared to a muddied spring and run well, ruined well, that means he's ruined. He's damaged himself so much that you cannot see him as righteous anymore. He does damage to those he depends on, or who, who depend on him, I should say, and himself. His instability can be dangerous. He can betray you a family, a community, a nation. And that happens. But notice, it does happen. Righteous people do give in to the wicked sometime. He may start out great, a life of integrity, consistently showing signs of an honorable life, but then something gets a hold of him or her and they drop their standards, start to compromise and they may even become wicked themselves. And then they just spread a wide path of spiritual damage. This is someone who at one time obeyed the law, lived a righteous life as a believer, and then turns from God, his law, and turns on his own people. That's the picture here. This is a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. 
Once you lose your righteousness, you're no longer delivered from trouble and you're prone to harm. 11, 8, 12, 21. When his righteous character is broken, he takes others with him. That's often the case. Often the case. There are some, uh, perhaps, who turn from uh, the teaching of the Word of God or from a particular teacher who teaches the Word of God. He may take a handful with him or a lot of people with him. Be your own person. Study for yourself to be approved. Righteous. Be righteous in your own life. Do the right thing. Especially if you've benefited from a ministry for a long time, make sure if you turn from that, there's a very good reason. Very good. Verse 27, the problem of honoring self. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it honorable to seek out one's own glory. Let's look at the first line first. It's not good to eat eat much honey. We saw back in verse 16 that too much of a good thing, um, like honey, the stomach rejects. Uh, this is a figure of speech, by the way, called, uh, it's a rare one, we don't see it very often, often, but it's uh, typianosis, deliberate understatement to emphasize that this really is bad. A typianosis, uh, T-A-P-E-I-N-O-S-I-S, a deliberate understatement to emphasize that this is really bad. Don't eat too much honey. That's bad news. Compared to, nor is it honorable to seek out one's own glory. Now, it's one thing to just want to do well and get recognition for your work, but to push it, to seek a bigger honor than you deserve or just keep doing it or become unsatisfied because you don't think you get enough, But seeking honor for oneself can lead to the opposite effect. It becomes dishonorable to be seeking out glory. You overdo it. Now you become proud. And you um, don't show yourself as such a good uh, performer or good as you thought you were. Now it makes you look bad. You went overboard. And this stems from pride lusting for recognition, notice from others. At some point, it becomes empty and shallow and too much, and people just walk away. Now, a little encouragement or recognition from others is fine, but to pursue it yourself, that spoils it. Uh, Young people do this, especially in, I think, of high school. Uh, Boy, high school is a test for young people. If you ever go to high school, uh, it can mess people up for years, for years. Um, because that's where they get some of their worst grudges, that's where they learn attitudes, that's where they get into cliques, and that's why they get arrogant, uh, because they think they want to be something or impress somebody, and it's just so fouled up. You really need to have good Christian training to deal with high school, especially public high school. The point, the more one seeks his own glory, the more dishonorable he becomes. That's a good one to keep in mind. Even if you think you deserve more recognition or more credit, be very careful about seeking that. That can turn, turn around on you. Verse 28. Like a city that is broken into and without walls, so is a person who has no self-control over his spirit. So you can see the connection. Before, it's kind of a proud thing. Now we're saying don't be... Uh, Lose your control, let's put it that way. Don't lose your self-control. That's the idea. Like a city that is broken into and without walls. A city that's broken into and without walls, basically defenseless. Uh, A city without walls in the ancient world is largely very vulnerable. There's no restraining of whatever enemy wants to attack from anywhere, whether just a a better one or or a large group of enemy of some sort. As compared... To a person who has no self-control over his spirit. If you don't control your spirit, you set yourself up for a fall. So you're unrestrained, without control. 
anything can persuade you or move you and even take you over. Self-control is important. I, you know, even talk about an appetite. If you eat too much, if you drink too much, if you spend too much time with this or that or doing that, uh, watching movies or television or bad habit, uh, uh, it can take you over. That's the idea. You drop your defense. Your defense is your self-control. Remember that, folks, in so many ways in life. And uh, when you learn self-control, one of the great fruits of the Spirit, see, they didn't have the Spirit like we did or we do today in those days, but you have the advantage of the Spirit who can enable you to have self-control. But you have to depend on Him. You have to give it over to Him. People often use the phrase, well, just give it over to God. Well, that's true, but understand how this works. It really helps. You let the Spirit control you. If you just give it over to God and say, okay, God, it's yours. And that's not quite the way it works. You have to allow the Spirit to control you. It's one thing to say, well, God, I'm giving it over to you completely. But at the same time, you've got to continue that trust and let his Spirit enable you to deal with that situation. Tremendous advantage we have today over the Old Testament saint. Those days, it was a matter of self-discipline. It's a matter of fear of uh, some sort of punishment if you broke the law. Today we're on the other side of that. We have the Spirit to enable us to do the right thing. And it's a matter of remaining controlled by the Spirit and being perceptive, uh, being discerning, knowing the Word of God, and keeping us in the realm of blessing. We have a, a wonderful era that we live in right now, the church age, with uh, living by grace and not under the law, having the Spirit, having the completed canon of Scripture to refer to constantly, which we should. This compares a person who has no, no self-control to a defenseless city. He has no control over his lust, his deepest desires, his temperament, his passion, even his willingness to do sin and or evil. He's defenseless before the wicked. He's easy prey for his enemies. He demonstrates no wisdom in controlling himself. No one is safe with him. He can't even protect his own heart and mind. And the spiritual life is, well, it can be practically nothing because he's subject to the whims of the world and the lust of his own sin nature. Well, that ends chapter 25, and we move on now to chapter 26, where we continue in our same major category, uh, what we've been calling Solomon, uh, part two, Roman numeral two, uh, 25, 1 through 29, 27. It's a long section. Verse 1 speaks of don't honor fools. It's inappropriate to honor fools. Let's look at verse 1. Like snow in summer and like rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Now, when you see snow in summer, that's that's weather that's just, well, I would just call it out of whack. It's wacky weather. We've had some wacky weather. It snowed in the summertime. I didn't know that ever happened until I made a trip to Alaska as a young man and got snowed on in uh, uh, June, early June, I think it was, the summertime. But we were way up in northern Canada, and it was snowing, a blizzard, in fact. But that's a different part of the world, not normal for most people. And that's the situation here. Snow in the summer or rain at harvest. Harvest is a time where it's more dry. Uh, you don't want a lot of rain there. It can spoil the crop. It can flood the crop. It can ruin the crop. And that's uh, not fitting for that particular season. As compared to uh, it's not fitting. So honor is not fitting for a fool. Don't give a fool honor. 
And uh, this is a good example of God's uh, rule of the world. This is the seasonal rule, okay? Generally speaking, it snows in the winter. Isn't that true? It's generally true. That's right. Uh, we're getting into the cooler weather now here in Texas this time of year. Uh, we've had a very hot and uh, severe drought in the last few months. It's just in the last couple of weeks starting to get cooler. It's been a wonderful relief. In fact, it's got unusually uh, cool, just like it was unusually hot for a long time, having almost a whole month, I think it was August, and a good part of uh, September. Uh, August, I think, was largely in the hundreds. And September, uh, I think it was in the 90s and hundreds. So it's nice to have cooler weather and actually spend some time outside in the afternoon without dying. <laughs> well, here, here's what we see. It's a good example of God's rules for uh, the world. Just as God has a seasonal order of things to keep the world supplied with food, so also there's a social order, a social order of how to treat certain people. We have seen many ways in which the fool rejects wisdom. To honor him would be the opposite thing to do. In fact, it would strengthen him and encourage his foolishness. Remember that. Don't encourage a fool the wrong way or try to strengthen him. Well, it'll be okay if you did that, since you did that idiotic thing. No, it won't. See what I'm saying? Be careful how you talk to people. If someone is foolish, uh, don't encourage them. <laughs> it would uh, it turns things around. It's it's wacky. All right, to honor a fool would turn things upside down, especially with people who are gullible. They say, "Oh yeah, I'm just going to continue right on being foolish." So that's the idea here. So honor is not fitting for a fool. Now most of us would, common sense would tell us this. Just tells us the Bible is full of wisdom that gives us some of those same principles of how to live uh, the best way among people. This one is among a fool. Verse 2 speaks of an undeserved curse. Bring some birds in the situation here. 26.2, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, so a curse without cause does not come to pass. Now you've seen flitting birds. They just they're out there just kind of flitting and flipping their arms or their arms, their wings real fast, and they jump up and down, they hop around, they're not very stable. Uh, that's the idea here. They just fly from here to there, they you know, they're like darts. They go from one end of the barn and barn swallows, they go one end to the other end to the other end to the other end, and they just go back and forth. They're not stable. That's the idea. All right. These birds don't settle down. Uh, we call them, they keep fidgeting. If you apply it to a human more. They just don't land and just stop, or they don't seem to be able to land for more than a couple of seconds if they do at all. This is compared to a curse that is undeserved or without cause. Uh, it's a flighty curse. It doesn't fit. So as a flighty bird can't just land, so a groundless curse. In other words, you see a curse, or maybe you want God to curse someone, but they're not guilty. Don't expect it to happen. Don't expect it to happen. It's not going to land on them. Now understand, in the Old Testament, terms like a curse was a heavy thing. It was the penalty for not obeying the law. This was true for the nation of Israel. You could get a, uh, we'd call it just a, uh, a big uh, repercussion for not obeying the law. This was true in the nation of Israel. Let's listen uh, to Deuteronomy 28.15. I'm going to use the ESV on this one. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. This is, the, this is from the curse section of the curse and blessing section, I should say, 
of the law, the Mosaic law. If Israel did not obey the law, they, were, they fell under curses, cycles of curses. If they didn't repent, they could get worse and worse and worse. But if they start to do the right thing, they can get blessed and blessed and blessed. Very simple. Pretty simple. If they obeyed, blessing. If they disobeyed, cursing. A heavy curse. A nation could even be destroyed if they never repented and kept going the way of the world. Sin and evil. Keep in mind there's a continuing curse on people who do not love the Lord, don't follow the Lord. Because they're following the God of disobedience, the God of this world. And they live under his curse. They'll never be truly happy or have that kind of peace. They'll get satisfaction out of this and that, but no lasting peace or satisfaction. That's why they continue to look for more. 1 Corinthians 16.22 Let anyone who has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. That's Paul writing. O Lord, come. You know, people who don't love the Lord, and that's most people, just keep in mind, they live under the curse of not knowing Jesus. It's a sad thing. Uh, that's why they've got to have their ball games, they've got to have their drinking, they've got to have their parties so they can get some fun out of life. Otherwise, life is all miserable. It's all, all work. It's all unhappy. It's all dependent on something else rather than the Creator to bring peace and happiness. Let's go to Numbers 23.8. Here is a lesson on keeping in mind that God does the cursing. We've talked about that recently. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? Now, anyone may wish a curse or pronounce a curse, but it is worthless unless God chooses to carry it out. Verse 3 turns to what is fitting. Now we've seen what's not fitting. Uh, let's go to what's fitting. What fits? Verse 3, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. I love the way this is categorized sometime. We go to animals, then we go right back to a fool and what he has in common. Um, with animals, he needs some sort of control, some sort of discipline. As a whip will spur on a war horse, that could be a translation, or a bridle, actually a bit that controls a donkey. So a rod keeps fools from doing more foolish things. And literally, this is a rod. Uh, we talked about the, the uh, well being ruined. Maybe he ruined the water. He did something really stupid. Um, he muddied it up or did something upstream he shouldn't have done. And now the water's fouled. And people say, well, you messed it up for the whole... We won't have water for two days now or something. It's severe. Well, they may take a rod to him. That's it. Don't throw him in jail. Don't fine him necessarily. But it just uh, basically says, uh, we're going to just whip you. And you... That's a discouragement from doing it again. Actually, it's probably much better than throwing someone in jail. Uh, that's often a... A relief for him from society, and he needs to get in the society and make the right adjustments. Think about these animals for a moment. Both have a lot of power and require a lot of training and severe control to make them useful to carry out whatever duties or tasks you have for them. To tame a wild donkey or put a war horse through a school of training takes a lot of energy and effort. So does sometime get in the foolishness out of a fool. Now this may sound severe, but the point is that it takes some stern discipline to knock the foolishness out of some people. Now think about that. Uh, we know that's true with children. 
But sometimes people just grow up and they never really get the discipline they needed. They never really got the foolishness out of their heart and they're always doing something. Well, we might use the word stupid or dumb. But foolish is the word we often see in Scripture. The rod was used for punishment in the ancient world. We've seen that already in the Proverbs 10, 13, 17, 10, 19, 29. Verse 4 again about a fool. Do not answer a fool according to his foolishness or you will be like him. Even you. The way that emphasizes this at the end. Even you, you'll be like him. Pretty simple one. Do not answer a fool according to his foolishness. Now, it doesn't say not to answer him. Okay, don't, don't miss that. It doesn't say not to answer him. But do not answer according to his foolishness. Don't play his game. Don't uh, be like him. Because if you do act like him, you answer him like a fool, you'll start to be like him. Don't match an insult with an insult or a harsh statement with a harsh response or exchange a lie for a lie or do something like he did just to get back. That's the idea. You'll be like you'll be the fool then. If you do that, you'll bring yourself down to his level, the level of fool. And then for emphasis, even you, yes, even you will be acting like a fool. So strange to think about this for a moment because you you obviously see that was foolish. But now you're going to act foolish to try to straighten him out or get him back. Now you're acting foolish. So what you want to do is to show the fool what he should do. And this would be actually overcoming evil with good. Now, folks, people often get confused on this, and I and I have to battle this now and then with, with folks. But, you know, sometimes being stern and truthful is far better than just trying to be nice and not correcting them. Well, you're going to hurt their feelings. Well, it's better to hurt their feelings than have them hurt a dozen people. Maybe they have a gossipy mouth. You might just say, you know, if you didn't gossip, that wouldn't happen. What do you mean gossip? Because you said this about them, and it was a private affair. It was really none of your business. Well, who are you to tell me that? I said, because I'm trying to help you. Because you create animosity among people when you do those things. And maybe some truth will break through, you see. But you need to show them their foolishness. And yes, it takes a little courage. Uh, especially if it's someone who you really have respected for a long time and suddenly you find them getting out of, out of line. You know, a, a wise person would appreciate the correction. We've learned that already. Well, the next proverb tells us what to do in answering a fool. Verse 5, answer a fool according to his foolishness, lest he become wise in his own Eyes. Now, this is interesting. According to his foolishness. Answer a fool according to his foolishness. First of all, we know we're not supposed to uh, commend him for his foolishness, right? And we're not supposed to answer him uh, according to his foolishness. But So what this is saying is, if you do that, If you answer a fool according to his foolishness, he'll think he's wise. You see, he's got you. Let's break it down a little bit more. First of all, the admonition, the command is to say something. Do not be silent. Okay, I tried to uh, make that right, rightly clear in the previous verse. You do answer him. Don't be silent. Say something. Being silent is basically being passive on this and not helping anybody. But the goal is to get that fool's upside world, upside down world to flip back over to where he hears and understands how he's being a, fe- a fool. In other words, he needs to hear the truth. And if you say nothing, 
there's a real possibility that he believes he is right. And that's what it means, this next line, this second line. Lest he become wise in his own eyes. So if you are silent and say nothing, they will think there's nothing wrong and that he is wise. Now here's the thing. To respond to a fool may be uncomfortable for you. Or you may even be afraid. But you need to speak up if you're involved with this person somehow or responsible for them or you want to help them. It's a way of showing love. You know, when you give the gospel and you read some of the scriptures to them, like some of the well-known ones, John 3.16, and it says if you don't believe, you're condemned already, right? That's not good news on that end. But he can get out of that. So you sometimes give them bad news to let them know if you reject the good news, things are going to be continually worse. Well, in the next five verses, we turn to the father or sage using negative analogies. We just saw the weather and the animal analogies, and now we're going to see some rather unusual, in fact, we might even say, ridiculous images. And that's where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. It's been challenging again today. Uh, these wise sayings help us understand the way the world runs and how you want us to benefit in it. So we ask in the, that in the power of the Spirit we'll properly apply these things. In Jesus' name, amen.